Welcome to Public Health Live, the third Thursday breakfast broadcast. I'm Joyelle Ray Alexander, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to ask that you please fill out your online evaluation at the end of the webcast. Continuing education credits are available after you take our short post test, and your feedback is helpful in planning future programs. We encourage you to let us know what topics are of interest to you and how we can best serve your needs. As for today's program, we will be taking your questions throughout the hour by phone. The toll-free number is 800-452-0662, or you may send your written questions by fax. The fax number is 518-426-0696. We will also be taking questions by email. Please email us at any time throughout the hour at phlive.newyork at gmail.com. Today's program is Engaging and Activating Patients for Better Health, the Power of the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. Our guest is Lisa Ferretti, a social worker and public service professor and co-director of the Center for Excellence in Aging and Community Wellness. Thank you very much for being here, Lisa. Thank you, Joelle. I am thrilled and honored to be here today. Thanks. Well, this is an exciting topic, and we're going to get right into it. We're, we're here to talk about the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, but before we do that, I, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what self-management is. Sure. Um, self-management really focuses on the patient and what the patient believes is happening with their health care and their chronic um, condition. Um, so it really um, focuses to help people to understand how to build confidence that they can better manage their chronic health condition. And so by recognizing the patient's central role, um, we really approach this differently. So rather than um, prescribing things for people necessarily, we focus on getting people to think about what's important to them and how they can make changes and how to make decisions about how to um, implement the changes that they want to make in their lives. And so um, it really builds uh, people to develop proactive strategies and adaptive strategies so that they can manage the day-to-day -day management of their chronic health condition, whatever that may be. And it also employs kind of a team-based effort. So we really look at it as a, whole less, a holistic kind of team approach where we really want everyone who's part of the healthcare team. So it's not just the doctors and the nurses and the patient, but also family members, um, friends, coworkers, and the community that really support the person as they, as they manage day to day their chronic health care. A truly comprehensive effort. Yeah, it definitely now, is. <laughs> now, it, it sounds a little, a little bit like patient health education. Why is self-management different from patient education? Yeah, I, you know, I think that the main difference between self-management education and patient health education is that self-management education really seeks to help people to build the skills that they need to make changes that they want to make in their lives you know, related to their health. So patient education um, provides people with the knowledge that they need about their health condition. So you know you need to learn about your disease and your disease process, what you can expect, what will happen, and that's really important. Um, but you also need to know how to apply that knowledge in your life. So how are you gonna you know make the changes that you might want to make? Um, Knowledge informs behavior change, but knowing something doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do it, right? So, Absolutely. you know, let me give you an example. 
Um, many people know that getting more physical activity on a regular basis is something that can really help your health. Is that something that you're aware of? Uh, you're absolutely right, but sure. you know, you, being aware of it and, and doing it, two different things. That's right, that's right. So you know that, and sometimes you still probably don't do it. So why? Why don't you do things that you know are good for you? Oh, I don't know, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> so probably for the same reasons many people don't, okay. right? You don't want to have enough time. You've got too many things going on. Maybe you're having pain that day. You know, mm. maybe there's other things happening in your life. Sure. So there all these reasons that you don't achieve things that you know are really good for you. And so self-management education really seeks to give people the skills and the tools that they need to be able to do those things on a regular basis. So you, that you know something that you learn from patient health education and self-management education helps you to do it. So it's really about the application of that knowledge. These two things are really complementary and we really can't do one well without the other. So, you know, I think we really need to find ways to make those things work better together. I agree. I agree. The Chronic Disease Self-Management Program has been around for a while. Now, but there seems to be a lot of interest in the program recently. Next, we're going to hear from Philip McCallion, professor and co-director of the Center for Excellence in Aging and Community Wellness. He will set some context into the recent expansion of the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. So let's take a look. Hi, I'm Philip McCallion. I'm with the Center for Excellence in Aging and Community Wellness. There are lots of good programs out there. One of the things that distinguishes uh, CDSMP is that there has been this very concerted effort supported by multiple agencies and multiple funders to develop an infrastructure across the country. And certainly here in New York, there has been very significant investments by Centers for Disease Control, by the Administration on Aging, by the Department of Health, by the State Office for the Aging, and then on a more local level, by hospitals, by um, county offices for the aging, by faith communities, there's a whole variety of partners but what all of that really means is that we're starting to see an infrastructure really being developed and really taking hold uh, in communities, certainly across the state and across the country, that it becomes possible that having been convinced that something like CDSMP might be very helpful for, for patients, that physicians and other health providers can say, you know what, I'm gonna refer you to a class and there will be a class that a person can be referred to. It's going to be happening within a time frame that makes sense and it's likely to be happening in a place that the person can access. And that's what infrastructure really is about. It's building something so that when someone can benefit from a program, it's actually available to them to be able to participate in it. So it's a very important part of what CDSMP has to offer today is that this infrastructure has been built and continues to be built. There's an awful lot going on in, in the healthcare environment at the moment. A lot of new initiatives, a lot of considerations around cost controls, a lot of considerations around better management of care, um, happening certainly within Medicaid and Medicare, but happening more generally as we look at the redesign of, of some of our healthcare system. Some of it clearly is being influenced as well by our considerations around the, the multiple chronic conditions framework, sort of really trying to understand, you know, and I'll step back a little bit. One of the things that's very striking to me is that we talk about the size of the chronic disease, uh, the, the population with chronic conditions and chronic diseases. And one of the factors in that is that for so many people, there's more than one chronic condition. And so we really are looking as, as within uh, the, the different reform efforts within healthcare at how do we grasp that? How do we do redesign our systems to better support the whole person? And so we're seeing initiatives like, certainly like um, health homes, medical homes. We're seeing initiatives that again, focus much more upon self-management um, and, and the linkage in with community supports and resources. CDSMP clearly offers an opportunity uh, to be able to advance some of those things. Within one of the, the, if you like, the stable of CDSMP programs, the Diabetes Self-Management Program, there's already efforts to look at making that particular program reimbursable under Medicare. Um, there are explorations happening as to where 
the, this program fits within constellations of services, if not, if not to be reimbursed specifically, can it be part of a package that can be reimbursed? I think, for example, under Health Homes, the ideas around that there be a self-management component of that, this becomes a program that potentially could be used to advance those kinds of ideas. And again, there's lots of other programs. There are programs that have evidence to support them as well. The attraction here is to think about that this is a program that's likely to have infrastructure, that's likely to be something that can be more universally available. And I think that we also have to think about this in terms of what's the potential to impact upon large numbers of people whole communities potentially, as well as, it, as, as addressing individual needs. And I think that that's the promise that CDSMP offers uh, in the midst of all of these reform efforts. Well, that was some great information that, that Philip covered. Th there's obviously increased interest in self-management education and the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. Lisa, what do you think is behind this? What do you think is moving the, the interest? Well, I think there's many things that are moving the interest. Um, I'll maybe talk just about a few. Um, first, the national data is really pretty compelling. Um, when you consider that over the past 10 years, we have seen a steady increase of the numbers of people with chronic conditions, and we're projected by 2030 to have about 170 million Americans who are living with chronic conditions. So. That's an increase of about 37%. So there's certainly you know, interest in how we're gonna better manage this as we move forward because we know we're gonna have people living longer and with more chronic conditions. Um, the second thing I think is that we also um, recognize that people with chronic conditions represent a, 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 a lot of cost to the healthcare system. And so I don't wanna you know, overplay um, the, the concerns everyone has about costs, but certainly healthcare costs are rising, and a lot of the um, healthcare costs that are rising are related to these chronic healthcare conditions. So it's not as much maybe the ongoing care, but more the acute events that can happen from for people who really have long-term health conditions. And the more health conditions somebody has, the more likely they're going to have an, a hospital inpatient stay, and they're going to be in the hospital probably longer. So that's kind of moving um, interest as well, because you know there's a cost question about that, but Beyond the cost piece, um, the fact that we have people living with multiple chronic conditions is also a, of great interest to everybody at this point because, you know, we've got to figure a way to help manage this. I mean, our, our healthcare system was set up to manage acute care. So people get sick, they go to the doctors, they get better. Well, that's not what happens with a chronic healthcare condition. You know, you get sick, you know, you get better because you get some treatment for your condition, but you've got to figure out how to manage this now for the rest of your life. And, you know, there's a lot of work at the national level looking at how, how are we going to do this if we know that we're going to live longer and live longer with um, chronic conditions. So that's another thing that's moving um, the interest. And I think the third piece that's really important is what we've seen in really the advent of technology. Um, technology particularly thinks like electronic health records um, and other types of interactions that we can now have with patients in an ongoing way presents this opportunity, if you will, uh, to figure out how we can really work with people in their self-care. Because if we think about it, really, care that we get from our physicians when we have a chronic health care condition probably is about 5% of the time, you know, out of the whole piece of this, right? 95% 95, 95 of the care that we do is self-care. It's what we do at home. It's the decisions we make about what we're going to eat and when we're going to exercise and how we're going to take our medications and all those things. And so technology represents an opportunity for us to influence that with people and really be uh, more of a team, uh, you know, on a more day-to-day -day basis. So I think that all those things and, and many other things are moving that interest. Okay, well, well, many other things, as you said. So so maybe, maybe you could tell us in a bit more detail if you will, mm -hmm. Lisa, about the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. How was it developed and how do we know that it works? Okay, well, I'd be happy to tell you more about that. And actually, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is that we don't call it the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. <laughs> um, and that's largely because a lot of people actually living with chronic health care conditions don't actually identify with that language. So the one, of the one of the very few things you can change about the program is the name. And so here in New York State, we actually call it the Living Healthy New York Program. But it's known by many, many other names, you know, in many places around the country and really around the world. Um, 
what you need to know that's really important, I think, about the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, or I might call it now the CDSMP for short, um, is that it's an evidence-based health promotion program. So it was developed with a randomized control trial, um, and through that randomized control trial, um, a, a number of participants were sort of, you know, put into the intervention group and into the um, control group or the group that didn't receive the program. And what we really saw were significant changes um, in uh, se self-management, in health status, in symptom management, um, and other things for the folks who took the program. So unlike many other programs, you know, the CDSMP has this, you know, large amount of evidence behind it. In addition to that, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program actually addresses the concerns and the problems that are really common to people who have any type of health condition. So you don't necessarily, um, it's not just a class for people with diabetes, but people with diabetes are in the same class as people with arthritis, osteoporosis, heart disease, depression, et cetera. Um, and because of that, you actually have these incredible interactions between the participants that really help people to support one another and to learn strategies from one another in a very encouraging and interactive environment. Um, so it's a really um, dynamic program as well. So I think that that also attracts a lot of people to it. It's also a program that's really appropriate for caregivers. Um, people who take care of other people oftentimes really are more focused on the person they're taking care of than on themselves. And they may very well have chronic health conditions of their own. So the program helps caregivers to see both how to better manage their own condition, but also how to deal with some of the problems that they might be having, trying to help someone else who is also a self-manager, by the way, <laughs> um, trying to make those decisions. And so I think it has a lot of dynamic um, pieces in terms of that as well. You know, it gives people an opportunity to really figure this stuff out, practice the skills, um, and learn how to apply them, and then get feedback from their peers um, as they sort of work through how they're going to manage their day-to-day -day management of their chronic health care. Would, would a caregiver uh, be at one of those sessions with their patient or independent of their patient or, or a combination of both? Yeah, actually it could be both. And, um, you know, it's, it's very dynamic when you have caregivers and the people they care for in the same workshop um, because you know a lot of light bulbs go off for people as you go through these things you know one of the things we see that's real interesting with caregivers is that oftentimes caregivers want to make goals that are really the goals of the people they're caring for <laughs> um, and so while sometimes we see some tension there's also a, an opportunity to really bridge some of that and help everybody to um, have better better interactions now Lisa you touched upon the self-management techniques mm -hmm. how do they work yeah, so self-management techniques, you know, are the things that we teach people in the workshop that help them to learn how to apply these things. So some of the things we do is we have people set short-term goals, like they make what we call a weekly action plan. And so they decide what they want to do, they implement the plan, knowing that they're going to come back the next week and talk with the participants in their workshop. So there's a little bit of accountability and so some gentle persuasion that happens. Um, but it also is a way for people to taste success. So if they pick something that they're successful with, they get a lot of positive reinforcement. Um, from the group. If they're not successful, what they also get is they get an opportunity to help figure out why. So some of that problem solving, so to develop those kinds of problem solving skills that will help them ongoing to manage outside of the workshop. Um, we also have a lot of symptom management techniques that we see used, so cognitive symptom management, or thinking type techniques that we use, um, like distraction, positive thinking, um, progressive muscle relaxation, those kinds of things. And other types of strategies um, that we use. We have like this whole self-management toolbox that teaches people multiple tools, but beyond just the multiple techniques or tools is that we teach people that most of those tools can be used to address many of the symptoms, whether they're physical symptoms or emotional symptoms or whatever. Um, and that actually gives people sort of a real arsenal, you know, that they can kind of go after um, the problems that they're experiencing. And so it's really very powerful. Uh, powerful and very interesting. Is, is there research to, to, to kind of support what you're telling us about? Yeah, yeah, there is. As I mentioned earlier, it's an evidence-based health promotion program, and so it was tested through randomized control trials. The original work was done by Dr. Kate Lorig and her colleagues at the Stanford Patient Education Research Center, um, and they did a randomized control trial with over uh, slightly over a thousand people. Um, again, some in the control group and some in the intervention group. And those improvements I already mentioned: self-rated health status, symptom management and also reductions in ER visits and physician visits. Um, the other real interesting piece is we talk a lot about increasing your confidence. Well, the, the higher the increase in confidence or self-efficacy at six months, at the six-month follow-up for these patients, the lower their healthcare utilization was at a year. So we see that when we increase people's confidence, 
even in the short term, in the long term, we can reach benefits from that. And uh, many of these health benefits and these um, cost savings held for 6, 12, 24, and even 36 months for some people. So really exciting. Um, I think the, the last thing I'll mention about that is that the CDC arthritis program actually um, recently did a, a meta-analysis, which is sort of a study of the studies, if you will, of the CDSMP. Um, and they ended up selecting around 23 different um, research um, articles that had been um, uh, other implementations of the CDSMP, you know, whether for different target populations or in different settings, et cetera. And um, the, the study of the studies actually showed that on many of the same um, variables that we looked at, we saw small to moderate um, changes or effects, which, you know, means that there's also a possibility for a, potentially for a public health intervention for this as well. So it's not that it's just in particular settings, but we're seeing those things hold across settings and across populations. Now, and in addition to benefits to the participants, mm -hmm. are there financial benefits as well? Yeah, there are. Um, so part of the uh, Stanford study was also to do some cost effectiveness studies to sort of look at, you know, is this going to save money? Um, and so we did see um, in the studies, the original research studies, cost savings for patients of somewhere between four and five hundred dollars. Um, um, per per patient, and at the same time, we saw reductions in hospital inpatient stays, which we all know can be very expensive. Um, and all of these obviously point to the uh, um, the opportunity for potential savings for the um, CDSMP for patients, but also for systems. So um, another um, piece of the the work that they did out at Stanford was in looking at a healthcare system, and in this case, it was Northern Kaiser Permanente healthcare system. And when they looked at the people who took the program versus the people who did not for that system, they found that for just slightly under 500 patients, the system saved $400,000. So it's easy to see how the benefits for this, you know, the financial benefits can really add up quickly. Now, at least I understand that, that the uh, CDSMP also has several associated programs. Can you tell us about the other versions uh, yeah. of the program? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, that's been kind of an interesting thing that's developed as well. So the, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program is what we sort of think of as the flagship program. Um, it has, um, you know, it's for everybody and it catches everybody um, no matter what type of chronic health care condition you have. But there were also several other um, iterations of the program that have been developed. Um, one that I want to talk about particularly is the the Spanish language version of the CDSMP, which is called the Tomando Control de Su Salud program, and I'm sorry, my Spanish is not great. <laughs> um, and this was actually studied in another way, you know, so it had additional studies with it to, to provide a cultural translation of the program. So it's not a direct translation from English to Spanish, but rather um, it, was, it was studied to see that the program itself made more sense to people um, of Spanish language cultures. Um, it still uses all the same core tenets, so it still has um, self-efficacy, action planning, problem solving, all those same things, but it also has other things that are specific to this um, target population. In addition to that, and I think they're listed on the screen right there, uh, there's a number of other programs, and I'll just mention um, one of the more condition-specific programs, and that's the Diabetes Self-Management Program. That's also available in English and Spanish. That program, you know, has about 50 to 60 percent of the same things that we see in the CDSMP, so those same self-management tools and strategies, those core tenants. But in addition to that, it has some other guidance to help people who are living specifically with diabetes or caring for people with diabetes. So it really provides additional information on things like managing, you know, your blood sugars and, you know, planning meals, planning for sick days, that sort of thing. And, and all the other disease-specific programs do similar things. Thank you, Lisa. Sure. Well, it certainly sounds like there is a lot of evidence to support using the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program to help engage people more fully in their health care. This might be a great time to hear about the benefits of the program from someone who is taking the workshop. Let's take a look. Hello, my name is Norma Pettit, and I'm a member of the program Healthy Living. Healthy Living, to me, believe Believe in myself. You know, even when you go to the doctor, you don't tell them everything. And some doctors don't care about whether you bring notes or not. Oh, put them away, they'll say. But you, when you go to the doctor, you can't remember everything, and you only have a few minutes with them. But then you get back home, and it's like, now I don't know what to do for myself. But by talking to each other, we've maybe had the same experience. So sometimes we get more help from each other. Since I started the Healthy uh, Workshop uh, six months ago, I've disciplined myself. I really do my walking. I really do the walking on the stairs. 
I have a pump bicycle and I, I have it right in front of my couch and I use it several times a day, maybe only a couple minutes, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. But it's there for me when I want it, when I need it. I might sit down for a few minutes and I'm up, I find, I, I'm always thinking of something to do. And that's probably one of the best things for me because if I don't do it, nobody else is there to do it. If I drop something on the floor, if I don't pick it up, there's nobody else behind me to pick it up. I enjoyed it. We looked forward to it. We made sure that, uh, I think everybody that signed up for it was there every, every meeting. We visit and we joke and we laugh. And laughing is also good medicine. I think the more people that we can get to come to these things, they'll live a better life. Well, you know, it's easy to see why people like the workshops and the personal benefits, but I'm also wondering if there are benefits to health care providers as well. You talked about health care or care providers and, and, or caretakers, and I'm wondering, do health care providers also reap benefits from the, from the program and yeah, the workshops? Yeah, absolutely they do. I mean, the, the first and most obvious one is the potential for, you know, cost savings that we've talked about. And so, you know, cost savings, not just about dollars that, um, health care dollars that people spend, but also the resources that are available in health care systems and in health care provider offices, et cetera. So that's one um, potential benefit that's pretty obvious. But beyond that, you know, I think the real interesting thing about this is, you know, I work with a lot of health care providers. Um, in the field, many who I'm trained, who I've trained um, to be leaders or trainers for this program, and you know what you hear all the time really is that healthcare providers are just as frustrated as patients are when things are not going the way that they should be going. So you know people get into the healthcare profession because they want to help people to have better clinical outcomes or better health outcomes. They don't get into the system necessarily to have to worry about all these you know other you know the business aspects of this. So I think that, you know, what I learned from that is that, you know, there's an opportunity and, um, and potentially a benefit for healthcare providers to build better interactions with their patients, which hopefully leads to better health outcomes, you know, for everybody. Um, I think that, you know, a good example of this is what we see in the, the chronic care model, um, which is a, a kind of a roadmap, if you will, for um, effective management of chronic health conditions. So remember we said earlier that acute conditions is sort of what our system is set up for, well, the chronic care model actually helps us to look at this system together, all right, where it's not just about what patients do and it's not just about what the system can do, but it's how those things interact to create these good interactions between um, patients and, uh, you know, and their providers. Well, tell us a little bit more. How, how exactly does it work? Sure. Um, so I think there's like a graphic up there that gives you sort of, uh, this is the you know, graphic representation of the chronic care model um, on your screen. And what you can see is that the overall goals, um, of course, which is at the bottom there, are improved outcomes. It doesn't say improved outcomes just for patients, but it's just improved outcomes, right? So everybody wants to benefit. Um, the key to this are these pro you know, productive interactions between providers and, and patients or providers in their system, all right? So productive interactions, not just good communication, but actually interactions that are you know, helping to to improve these outcomes. Um, you also see, and I don't know if there's a, maybe they can circle that, but there's a, a, a bullet there on self-management support. Um, so we have, you know, the healthcare system side, we have the community healthcare side, and then we have within the community healthcare side, self-management support. Self-management support, you know, is what activates patients to get engaged in this interaction. Um, and take advantage of both community resources, but also to work better with the healthcare system. So the CDSMP, which is a self-management program, <laughs> obviously is a really good fit. It fits into that niche really well because it's a community-based program. Um, it's uh, the intervention meets people where they live and where they live with their chronic health care conditions um, and where they manage that 95% of self-care. And so hopefully, you know, what we see from all of this um, improved interaction is that we have patients who are more informed and more activated, better able to influence their own health outcomes, and better able to engage in these productive interactions with their health care systems and hopefully health care systems that, that really feel that they can meet the needs of their patients as well. Well, Lisa, take us through that. What do informed and activated patients do? Yeah, well, they do lots. Lots, actually, so um, informed and activated patients are people who are engaged in their health care. You know, so they're people who both seek knowledge about their condition, but also um, seek to make changes in their behavior that will help 
them um, to have better health outcomes and have better personal wellness. So there's a, you know, again, another graphic up here that describes something called the patient activation measure. This is a measure that kind of sets people on a continuum, you know, from one to four, um, with one being sort of the least active, although not active at all, and four being folks who are really active in their engagement around their healthcare conditions. So, you know, obviously we like to see everybody be a four, but not everybody's there. Um, and so it's important to remember though that at every level, even if you're, you know, in that level four where you're maintaining largely your health um, behavior changes, et cetera, you know, even folks in that level can still benefit from self-management education because if uh, an adverse event happens or, you know, if something, uh, you know, some crisis happens and they falter, you know, they now may be sort of set back or relapse a little bit in terms of, you know, their level of activation, um, maybe get a little disillusioned that the things they were doing didn't make a difference, et cetera. So there's an opportunity always for us to be moving people along the scale, you know, and seeing if we can get patients who are more activated. Now, in here in New York State, we actually did some interesting work with the patient activation measure. We um, surveyed about 500 people who were folks who were coming to our chronic disease health management programs, um, and we, you know, took a look at where they were at baseline on this scale, and we saw that about 65 percent, so two-thirds of the people who were coming to these programs, you know, were in the stage one, two, or three, so who really had a significant op opportunity to potentially progress along this scale and hopefully could really take great advantage of the self-management education through the CDSMP. Now, we don't know yet um, because we don't have all the data in whether or not it moved people on that scale. But we, you know, we're sort of you know speculating that that's that's what happens. That people who engage in a program like the CDSMP will become more activated patients and will move a little bit on that scale because they'll now have some of these tools and strategies that they need to be successful and to build confidence. And we're hoping, you know, that when we have all the data, that that's exactly what it's going to show. Um, and in addition to that, we collect a lot of other data. So the, the measure actually can also help us to understand not just who took the program, but who benefited the most from the program. Because when we you know, kind of couple that up with all the other information we have, like health outcomes information and completer ratios, et cetera, we can find out who the program actually is, is the best fit for which also helps us to understand who it's maybe not the right fit for, the CDSMP, and then what do we need to do to get folks ready to really take advantage of self-management education? Well, uh, my understanding is that there are other, uh, you know, chronic disease self-management programs right, yeah. out there. Why would healthcare providers choose the chronic disease self-management program you know, right. over, over others. Right, well, hopefully they just take my word for it, but if they won't, <laughs> um, you know, don't take my word for it because, you know, the, one of the reasons you would pick this over some of the other programs is really because it has been around so long, because it has been tested in so many ways with so many populations um, and in so many different settings and we know that it works. It works in community-based settings, it works in clinical settings, it works for you know uh, old people, it works for younger people. We know that it works for everybody. We've got all this evidence that shows that people can make these changes and that these changes stick. They stick for six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, and even 36 months in some cases. So, so why not you know choose the CDSMP? I think one of the other reasons is that there has been a tremendous amount of effort in the last couple of years to disseminate this program really widely. And so the federal government, um, through some of the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act funds, uh, provided funding to the U.S. Administration on Aging who then disseminated that throughout 45 states and two territories to actually build an infrastructure to deliver this program. So while some of us were working on this, um, you know, this really allowed us an opportunity to ramp up the effort, you know, to the point where now we have a, a lot of New York State covered and this program can be available to people everywhere. So if you're a clinical provider and you're trying to figure out, well, how can I get somebody self-management education, you know, it might be just as close as the next community center or the, you know, the somebody right outside your door. Um, so in addition to the, the great evidence, we also know that it's really readily available in most places, and it's also a really low-cost model. Um, it you, relies largely on peers who are volunteers, um, and so while staff resources are used typically as trainers, peers who are volunteers deliver the program, and by doing that, we can keep the cost of the program down so that it's something that can become a part of regular clinical care without increasing you know, the burden of the cost of the program. So there's lots of really good reasons to choose this program. So cost benefits, evidence, access, research, deliverables, yeah. outcomes, you, you certainly have made a solid case. I think this would be a great time to hear from Bonnie, a nurse and health educator who has been working with the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program for several years. Let's take a look. 
Probably learning about self-evidence-based programs did change how I do look at educating people in the community. Rather than just standing and giving out the facts, that you have them work with goals and action plans and problem solving and brainstorming. And by individuals working through those methods, it does put them in the mode of thinking about their own care and self-management and putting them more in the driver's seat for it instead of just rote learning. Project Healthy Life uh, is important because it is evidence-based, but it's also important because it includes everyone with chronic disease, whether you have diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, arthritis, all those people have the same concerns, the same fears, the same problems. So when you put them all in a room together and have the class, they interact together and can help each other. Yeah. The very first course that we taught uh, in Cape May County was to a senior complex. And we had about 15 people in the class. And they went through the class doing very well, doing all of the activities, the action plans, the brainstorming. And when we got to the very last class, a man who had come to the first five classes in a motorized scooter came on a walker. A lady who had always come to class with oxygen that she used 24 hours a day, seven days a week, came without her oxygen, which really scared me. And then a man whose blood sugars had run constantly for several years in the 300s had had, he said, for the last three weeks of the course, nothing over 115 which was really good for somebody who has diabetes. I really do believe that these things were able to happen to these three people because of taking the six-week Project Healthy Life course. Now, Lisa, you were here to talk about chronic disease self-management programs in New York State several years ago. I, I recall that when things were just getting started at that time, I understand that in, in just the past two years, as part of the national effort to build infrastructure to deliver chronic disease self-management program, your center, partnering with the New York State Office for Aging and Department of Health, have expanded access to the program, to, to much of the state uh, yeah. through some of the innovative partnerships that we referred to early in the program. Can you describe how that's been done? Yeah, well, that was a big effort. So, <laughs> so we are one of the ERA states. New York State did receive funding um, from the ERA initiative through the U.S. Administration on Aging. Um, but I, I do want to say that you know we do we do have a really long history with the CDSMP here in New York State. So while those funds helped us um, to be able to expand the work that we were doing, a lot of this work was being done already, and it really provided a lot of opportunity to link that together. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, the focus here in New York State was largely on working with older adults with multiple chronic conditions. So even though many of our partners serve uh, many other people, and that was absolutely perfectly fine throughout this, our focus was really to work with older adults with multiple chronic conditions, largely because of the things that we mentioned earlier, but I think you know, there's also some other data we can kind of talk about related to that. Now, some of our decisions around that were driven a little bit by the funding, because the funding came from the Administration on Aging, so obviously, and through our partnerships. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you know, we have to recognize that folks who are older who have multiple chronic conditions um, are actually um, you know, impacting the healthcare system and are actually experiencing a lot of adverse effects from having these and not maybe having the good um, care that they need and self-management can really help with that. Um, also, you know, there's a, I think there's a graphic up about Medicare spending. So Medicare is the, you know, the public funding um, that funds health care for people over the age of 65 and also for people with disabilities. And when we really look at that, and, you know, this graphic represents that, we see that the spending for people with, with chronic conditions is higher, all right, the more, uh, the higher the number of chronic conditions, all right, so where people with five or more chronic conditions are using, I think it's around 59% of the um, health care resources in Medicare. So, you know, we wanted to uh, disseminate the program in a way that we could reach targets who could, had, could potentially both, one, really benefit health-wise from the program, um, two, hopefully maybe slow um, their progress on, um, uh, you, know, uh, progress, you know, the progressiveness of some of their chronic conditions, but three, you know, could also potentially represent a cost savings or a cost avoidance um, for Medicare and or other um, healthcare systems. So there's a lot of, you know, thought that sort of went into that and why we would do it that way. 
Um, now the way that we did it, um, here in New York State, we actually broke the state into six regions. So um, the regions are not sort of equal geographically because we have um, really some regions that have only a few counties and some that have up to 17. Um, but what we tried to do was by looking at that population, say to ourselves, you know, um, you know, within these regions, you know, who are the people that are, you know, at risk, the people who have more, you know, are 60 plus and have more than one chronic condition. And so we tried to break it up population wise so that there was an opportunity for each of the regions to reach similar numbers of people. Um, now, as I said, we have had a really long history of the, with the CDSMP here in New York State. Um, and so we also worked really hard to link in organizations that were already delivering the CDSMP because there have been many organizations who have been delivering this apart from, you know, any effort that the state has made. And so we really wanted to find those folks and we wanted to link them into this state effort so that together, you know, we could work to more broadly disseminate the program. We could link those partners with our new regional partners to build capacity quickly in an area so that the program became much more accessible much more quickly. Um, and we did all of that, you know, recognizing recognizing that we had to be really um, pay really close attention to the quality assurance and the quality improvement efforts of the program because we know that if we're ever thinking that people are going to fund these programs we have to be sure that we're delivering them the way that they were intended to be delivered um, and that that's consistent so that if you go into a program you know in you know Broome County and you walk into a program you know in um, New York City or you walk into a program in St. Lawrence County it's the same program. But th that must have been incredibly challenging because the state is so diverse you know geographically yeah. Graphically, but you know you've got suburbs and, and rural communities and urban communities yep. and large and small and you know how, how, how did you how did you go about zeroing in and, mm -hmm. and kind of tailoring the the the, uh, those, the the program for those those various uh, diverse um, yeah well that wasn't easy <laughs> so, that's a big question that wasn't really that easy but it was something that we really um, you know, did and did achieve. Um, what we did was we um, named like a read, uh, uh, excuse me, a regional lead. So in all of our regions, we worked with one particular partner who would sort of serve as the representative for that region to help disseminate information, to help to get training capacity built and to link in partners. Now, that's easy in, you know, some of the regions that are pretty small, but in say the Western New York region, which is around 17 counties, that's a little more challenging. <laughs> um, so then what it really became about was really about linking those partnerships together again. You know, how do we find folks who are doing this or who are interested um, and can we, you know, bring them to a central location and can we make them work well together or help them to work well together? A lot of that we actually did with technology. You remember I mentioned earlier technology. <laughs> um, and so we used an online learning community. Um, so we developed this, le this learning community um, as a way to disseminate information. It, you know, helped people with logistical support. So if they needed help with licensure, they needed help with bulk purchasing, they needed, you know, um, information about recruitment or training or quality assurance, whatever the case. And we used this online learning community to run monthly webinars. Um, we used it to disseminate information. We have forums on it and blogs. There's a shared calendar so you could find out, you know, where there was training um, near your um, near your location. Um, and we also have like a, a shared learning tool file cabinet. So all these kinds of things that not just we developed at the QTech but that were developed by many of our partners are, are housed there. So as a member of the online learning community you can get access to all these things very quickly and very easily you know, which really helped to be able to disseminate That's more exciting. broadly. Yeah, yeah, it was really, great. it was a lot of fun and I like technology so I was really happy to, to see that um, be a good vehicle to really do this and as you said, New York State is a big state. Um, so in any case, we also collected a lot of data on all of the, the work that we did. So we learned a lot about our partners. We learned a lot about the programs and the delivery sites. We learned a lot about the participants and how satisfied they were with the program. Um, we worked a lot with leaders to understand, you know, um, their delivery and how they were doing with that and to support them, you know, in their ongoing um, development as leaders of the program. Um, and we collected a lot of data um, related to the outcomes for patients as well, um, you know, as well as some of the other things we mentioned, the patient activation measure, et cetera. So, you know, hopefully, you know, all this data kind of comes together to tell the story of not just what we did, but what uh, what we achieved. I think will also tell us what we didn't achieve and what we need to do next. Um, and, you know, I, I can't talk to all that right now because we don't have all the data, but I'll just give a little plug for the fact that in May of this year, May 7th and 8th, we are going to be holding a summit on the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program where we're going to disseminate all the information about the program uh, and we're going to bring uh, multiple partners together to actually 
actually start working on sustainability plans for the program in all the different regions here in New York State. So, you know, if you're interested in that and you're in New York State, please stay tuned and, <laughs> you know, and tune in for that. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, all of this presented a great opportunity to disseminate the program and, and maybe we want to talk, I know we have some maps, so maybe I'll, I'll show people a little bit about what we did by looking at the maps. Um, so the first map we have, and I, hopefully you can see that on your screen, um, we can see the outline of the six regions. So each of the regions is kind of outlined um, with black. And so within that, hopefully you can find your county um, and you can see which region you're in. Um, and that will help you, um, again, if you go to the website and you're interested in learning um, about your region, you can find out um, uh, you know, who your regional contact is, et cetera. So if you want to learn more about things that way. So that's one thing um, to look at. The, the next map I want to um, have put up, um, so now you see there's all these shaded gray areas on the map. Well, the shaded gray areas represent um, counties that have the capacity um, to deliver the program. So by capacity, what we mean is that we have trained master trainers um, or trained leaders in those communities um, who are ready to deliver the program. So either they um, are delivering the program on their own or they are potentially available to train people in your organization to deliver the program for you. So roughly 50% of the state, maybe even a little bit more, um, more than 50% of the population of the state has capacity or has access to the program uh, because a, a lot of our population center is downstate um, and we have a lot of really robust programs in the New York City area. Um, but we also, you can see from the map, even as far north as St. Lawrence County and as far west as Erie and Chautauqua, I mean there's all kinds of capacity around the state for CDSMP. Now the next map is going to put some hash marks on there and what that will tell you is that in those counties we also have access to some of the additional programs so the things I mentioned earlier the Tomondo program um, you know the diabetes self-management program the positive self-management program etc so those are all accessible in those places as well and of course you know we can still bring the other programs to the other counties but this is where we have the capacity currently built from this uh, two-year two project um, the last math I'm going to show is really just to show you where we've delivered programs and so you know, we have, you know, obviously a lot of concentration of programs downstate area where we have a lot of population, but we've actually spread the program across the state fairly well. Um, and, you know, the different colored dots sort of represent the different programs. Most of the work's been done in um, CDSMP, but we've had a fair amount of work in the Spanish language versions of the program um, and the diabetes self-management program as well. So, you know, it's been a, a, a long road, um, but, you know, and, and this is not something we did. This is only something that we could have achieved really through all these really innovative partners partnerships, you know, with public health agencies, with area agencies on aging, with federally qualified health centers, with, um, you know, senior centers, um, community networks and community care networks, um, you know, I mean, just anybody and everybody, faith-based organizations, anybody who would, who would hear us, <laughs> um, you know, we brought the program to. So, uh, you know, it's been a tremendous effort by everyone in the state and, you know, and there's still work to do, as you see from the map, um, you know, but at least, you know, we, we feel that we really made a, you know, made a really good, um, start on, you know, trying to reach people, you know, everywhere in the state. Well, let's talk about those people. Okay. okay. Sure. Uh, what can you tell us about the people that you've reached through this particular effort, Lisa? Yeah, well, we reached a lot of people, um, although I will say we didn't really even scratch the surface of the numbers of people who could benefit from the program, but in New York State in the about, about 18 months, because it's been a two-year project, but it took us a while to get ramped up, but in about 18 months, we reached close to uh, 4,700 people, you know, which is not, not a small amount, but, you know, not near what we could do if we could really, um, you know, move the program a little bit more. Um, that happened in about 400 workshops, just a little less than 400 workshops. Um, and we reached people from ages 18 to age 100. So, you know, even though our target was largely older adults, and you can see that um, the mean age we had was just slightly under um, 70. So obviously we reached mostly older adults, but in addition to that, um, you know, we really did reach people across the board age-wise. Um, we also um, reached people who did not report having really good health. So remember we talked about the patient activation measure earlier? Um, you know, typically people who are more activated um, perceive themselves as having a better health status. Not always, but, uh, you, know, but you know, often. Um, but we reached, 25% um, of the people we reached really didn't feel that they had um, good health or felt they had poor health, which also presents to us, you know, some information about, you know, that we've reached beyond sort of what we call the low-hanging fruit or the people who normally join these programs, and we've 
found people um, who really have an opportunity to engage in their own self-management, maybe in a different way than they ever have before. So, and, and because we know the CDSMP typically moves health status for people, you know, we're really excited to be able to look at our data and find out what happens with that. Um, you know, in addition to that, we reached a very diverse group of New Yorkers, and I think there, there's a pie chart um, for that. Um, so people of all um, races and ethnicities, um, you know, we d delivered a lot of programs in um, other languages other than Spanish. We did a lot of work with Russian programs, Chinese programs, Korean programs, Japanese. Um, you know, so we had a, a lot of opportunity to reach a very diverse group of people in New York. I don't have a, a chart for this, but we did reach both men and women. We reached more women than men, um, which is pretty typical because women, I think two reasons. One, women typically are the joiners of these types of groups. Um, but two, um, I think that, you know, women also are living longer. And so when we see that our age range is on a higher end, you know, it's likely that there are more women to access. Um, but I think that also says that we need to do more work to reach men. <laughs> um, and so I don't want to downplay that. Like, good for us. I think we really need to reach more men. And so we also, uh, you know, reach, um, you know, men and women, but with some opportunities. Um, and we reach folks with multiple chronic conditions, which was our other target. We really wanted to um, meet, you know, meet folks who had one or more chronic, chronic conditions. And, you know, again, I think there's a chart for this. Um, but if you look at the overall effort, what we really, you know, here's sort of by region, and you can look where you are um, if you're interested in your region. But if you, I'll, you know, draw your attention to the focus of the New York State total. Um, and the New York State total, about 50% of the people that we reached had two or more chronic conditions. So we definitely, you know, found the people that we wanted to get into the program who could potentially benefit from it. Um, not that everybody couldn't, but, you know, in terms of our own target. So I think overall we reached our targets. Um, but we also developed really great partnerships that I think will be long lasting um, and that can help us to reach out to many more people than we've had the opportunity to reach so far. So, you know, so good job, but there's a lot more work to do. Well, you've made significant inroads. We, we have some questions that have come in uh, for you and let, let's get to those right away. Uh, this has come from the University of Connecticut. How can I support this kind of program in a specific chronic disease with a small underserved population with unique needs? Are there funding sources to demonstrate the feasibility and efficacy of this program in this small population? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, in terms of funding for the program and in terms of the long term, I mean, we're certainly looking at and is being looked at at the national level where there's potential long term funding for programs. In the short term, what I would suggest is that, you know, what you really need to do is um, identify kind of the target population. There's a lot of work actually going on in Connecticut because I've done some work with the folks there. Um, so there are CDSMP programs in Connecticut. Um, so, you know, one thing would be to link up with those programs and find out, you know, if there's a way for those folks to help you to deliver the program and build some capacity. And, and I would also say if it's a particular target population that's, you know, underserved, you know, certainly if it, this is a university-based question, there's an opportunity potentially for some research money, you know, to look at these kinds of things, et cetera. Um, and so, I mean, I'd be happy to, to kind of talk with that person, you know, more at length about some of those things and to connect them with the people in Connecticut that are doing the program if they're interested. And is there a website or contact information for you or a telephone number? For our yeah, viewers. yeah. There's a, a slide, and I don't know when they're going to put it up, but let me. I'll I'll read it to you now because, of course, I oh, don't. No, I'm sure they have. Okay, it. they yeah. have it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway. Yeah, well, that's the helpful resources. But there's some other helpful resources on your on your screen right now. So the first one is the Stanford Patient Education Research Center. So you can certainly um, contact them as well. Um, but in addition, yeah, here's our contact information here. We have an 800 number you can call us at. Um, we also have an email that's easily accessible. And we have staff there who can, you know, connect you directly with me if your questions are more specific to some of these efforts. Um, or if you just want to learn more about the program in your area, you can do that. Okay, let's return to some of the questions that have come in. Uh, has cancer or cancer screening ever been included in this program to reduce risk factors for cancer or to increase cancer screening? Mm -hmm. um, so, so certainly any screening of any type is something that we would hope when people are good self-managers and are activated patients that they're, you know, engaging in those kinds of behaviors. Um, we don't add things to the program, so we don't do, um, you know, we wouldn't add in uh, any type of screening to the program because the program itself, again, because it's evidence-based, you know, exists kind of on its own. But that said, we've had many, many cancer cancer patients in um, our programs. So, you know, there's certainly, um, again, there's a lot more information about that out there, but it's, it certainly is a good fit for that, yes. 
And how do you go about attracting and retaining participants? Yeah, uh, you know, I think the most important piece of recruitment is really helping people to understand what the program really is and what it really isn't. And remember we talked earlier, it really isn't patient health education. So if somebody thinks they're gonna come in and sit and bring their pill bottles and get a medi medical or medication reconciliation or listen to someone give them advice, that's not what happens. So we actually developed what, you know, what we call here in New York our version of a session zero, which is a recruitment strategy to help people to understand what the program is, um, to get them to see how interactive it is, and to use that as a way to recruit people into the program. So that's available on our website. Okay. Are there consistent lay leaders? Uh, do you pay lay leaders, or are they volunteers? Mm -hmm. um, we have had both models. Um, we have lay leaders who, um, in some places, uh, are paid a stipend of some sort. We also have many, many volunteer lay leaders. Um, and usually it's the role of the master trainer, you know, who trains um, lay leaders for an organization to try to mentor those people. Um, we do have dropout rates of lay leaders, so you know, lay leaders are people who have chronic conditions, so sometimes <laughs> they have to take care of their own health, and that means they can't lead programs. But largely the retention rate is you know, somewhere around 70% or so. Do you use community health workers? Um, we are starting to get into a lot more um, use of community health workers here in New York now that we're doing more partnership with federally qualified health centers, and community health workers are actually, again, great folks to be um, lay leaders for this program. When we uh, looked at the map of New York State, the map shows that the workshops, uh, someone indicates it, it doesn't show that the program exists in their area. Does this mean that, that a participant or, or, or a provider even could not participate if, if it's not specifically in their re in their no. area? No, absolutely not. Um, again, this is what we've been able to develop so far. Um, and in fact, this last couple of months of the training we have, at, or the, of the, the grant, we've been doing a tremendous amount of training to try and expand our reach. The Quality and Technical Assistance Center, you know, hopefully is here to stay. Um, so if you're interested in um, training, you can contact us and we can, you know, partner with you to figure out, you know, how do we get the program into your community? Okay, that's exciting. You described how healthcare providers can benefit from their patients participating in the CD uh, SMP. Mm -hmm. Can you give some examples, Lisa, of how a provider might recommend the program to patients? Um, yeah, I mean, well, I mentioned technology earlier, so an electronic health record is potentially a way that, you know, you know, this can be built into that for anybody who might have a chronic health condition that people could be referred to or recommended to this as a community resource. Um, I think beyond that, though, um, one of the things that's happening, you know, right now that represents a real opportunity are things like the medical homes and the patient-centered medical homes. We've done some work with some patient-centered medical homes, trained some of the staff, and that helps to link kind of clini the clinical piece, you know, back to the, you know this kind of ongoing care piece. We're also seeing out in Western New York. There's a whole effort um, to bring the CDSMP um, to physician practices. Some of that's just making physicians aware of the fact that these things are happening in their community. But it also is about working with them to understand how can they most quickly and easily recommend the program to people. Uh, one thing I will say about that, though, is you know we want to we all want to link you know doctors into this and other healthcare providers, but we've got to make sure we have programs readily available and happening ongoing because you know that's one of the challenges of these things is to keep the program available for the people who really need it. Well uh, Lisa this has been an extraordinary program you've provided wonderful information uh, you and Philip McKellen are doing a terrific job Thanks. you've certainly provided us with uh, great contact information background information evidence uh, that this is a program that works and your passion is infectious and so we appreciate you being here today. Sure. Well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you very much for joining us today. Please remember to fill out your evaluations online. Your feedback is always helpful to the development of our programs and continuing education credits are available. An archive of this webcast will be on our website within two weeks. To obtain Nurse Continuing Education Hours, CME, and CHES credits, learners must visit www.phlive.org and complete an evaluation and the post-test for today's offering. Please join us on March 15th for the next broadcast of Public Health Live on Teen Pregnancy Prevention, Lessons Learned from New York State. I'm Joy L. Ray Alexander. Thanks for joining us on Public Health Live. Thank you so much, Thank you Lisa. So much. You're, You're really great. Welcome. Thanks.
Welcome to Public Health Live, the third Thursday breakfast broadcast. I'm Joyelle Ray Alexander, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to ask that you please fill out your online evaluation at the end of the webcast. Continuing education credits are available after you take our short post test, and your feedback is helpful in planning future programs. We encourage you to let us know what topics are of interest to you and how we can best serve your needs. As for today's program, we will be taking your questions throughout the hour by phone. The toll-free number is 800-452-0662, or you may really look at it as a, whole less, a holistic kind of team approach where we really want everyone who's part of the healthcare team, so it's not just the doctors and the nurses and the patient, but also family members, um, friends, coworkers, and the community that really support the person as they, as they manage day to day their chronic health care. A truly comprehensive effort. Yeah, it definitely now, is. <laughs> now, it, it sounds a little, a little bit like patient health education. Why is self-management different from patient education? Yeah, I, you know, I think that the main difference between self-management education and patient health education is that self-management education really seeks to help people to build the skills that they need to make changes that they want to make in their lives you know, related to their health. So patient education um, provides people with the knowledge that they need about their health conditions. So you know you need to learn about your disease and your disease process, what you can expect, what will happen, and that's really important. Um, but you also need to know how to apply that knowledge in your life. So how are you gonna you know make the changes that you might want to make? Um, Knowledge informs behavior change, but knowing something doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do it, right? So, Absolutely. you know, let me give you an example. Um, many people know that getting more physical activity on a regular basis is something that can really help your health. Is that something that you're aware of? Uh, you're absolutely right, but sure. you know, you, being aware of it and, and doing it, two different things. That's right, that's right. So you know that, and sometimes you still probably don't do it. So why? Why don't you do things that you know are good for you? Oh, I don't know, Lisa. <laughs> So probably for the same reasons many people don't, okay. right? You don't want to have enough time, you've got too many things going on, maybe you're having pain that day, you know, mm. maybe there's other things happening in your life. Sure. So there are all these reasons that you don't achieve things that you know are really good for you. And so we send your written questions by fax. The fax number is 518-426-0696. We will also be taking questions by email. Please email us at any time throughout the hour at phlive dot new york at gmail dot com today's program is engaging and activating patients for better health the power of the chronic disease self-management program our guest is lisa ferretti a social worker and public service professor and co-director of the center for excellence in aging and community wellness thank you very much for being here lisa thank you joelle i am thrilled and honored to be here today Thanks. well this is an exciting topic and we're going to get right into it we're, we're here to talk about the chronic disease self-management program but before we do that i i wonder if you could talk a little bit about what self-management is. Sure, um, self-management really focuses on the patient and what the patient believes is happening with their health care and their chronic um, condition. Um, so it really um, focuses to help people to understand how to build confidence that they can better manage their chronic health condition. And so by recognizing the patient's central role, um, we really approach this differently. So rather than um, prescribing things for people necessarily, we focus on getting people to think about what's important to them and how they can make changes and how to make decisions about how to um, implement the changes that they want to make in their lives. And so um, it really builds 
uh, people to develop proactive strategies and adaptive strategies so that they can manage the day-to-day -day management of their chronic health condition, whatever that may be. And it also employs kind of a team-based effort. So self-management education really seeks to give people the skills and the tools that they need to be able to do those things on a regular basis. So you, you know something that you learn from patient health education and self-management education helps you to do it. So it's really about the application of that knowledge. These two things are really complementary and we really can't do one well without the other. So, you know, I think we really need to find ways to make those things work better together. I agree. I agree. The Chronic Disease Self-Management Program has been around for a while. Now, but there seems to be a lot of interest in the program recently. Next, we're going to hear from Philip McCallion, professor and co-director of the Center for Excellence in Aging and Community Wellness. He will set some context into the recent expansion of the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. So let's take a look. Hi, I'm Philip McCallion. I'm with the Center for Excellence in Aging and Community Wellness. There are lots of good programs out there. One of the things that distinguishes uh, CDSMP is that there has been this very concerted effort supported by multiple agencies and multiple funders to develop an infrastructure across the country. And certainly here in New York, there has been very significant investments by Centers for Disease Control, by the Administration on Aging, by the Department of Health, by the State Office for the Aging, and then on a more local level, by hospitals, by um, county offices for the aging, by faith communities, there's a whole variety of partners. But what all of that really means is that we're starting to see an infrastructure really being developed and really taking hold uh, in communities, certainly across the state and across the country, that it becomes possible that having been convinced that something like CDSMP might be very helpful for, for patients, that physicians and other health providers can say, you know what, I'm going to refer you to a class, and there will be a class that a person can be referred to. It's going to be happening within a time frame that makes sense, and it's likely to be happening in a place that the person can access. And that's what infrastructure really is about. It's building something so that when someone can benefit from a program, it's actually available to them to be able to participate in it. So it's a very important part of what CDSMP has to offer today is that this infrastructure has been built and continues to be built. There's an awful lot going on in, in the healthcare environment at the moment. A lot of new initiatives, a lot of considerations around cost controls, a lot of considerations around better management of care. Um, happening certainly within Medicaid and Medicare, but happening more generally as we look at the redesign of, of some of our healthcare system. Some of it clearly is being influenced as well by our considerations around the, the multiple chronic conditions framework, sort of really trying to understand, you know, and I'll step back a little bit. One of the things that's very striking to me is that we talk about the size of the chronic disease, uh, the, the population with chronic conditions and chronic diseases. And one of the factors in that is that for so many people, there's more than one chronic condition. And so we really are looking as, as within uh, the, the different reform efforts within healthcare at how do we grasp that? How do we redesign our systems to better support the whole